I've preached up here about half a dozen times since we moved up here and started coming. And it's normally at this point in the sermon when I talk about what Pastor Harold's sermon is or what his series is about and how I am just a cog in that series. And remember, Pastor Harold was, has been preaching on Romans 8, the heart of the gospel. And he said something last week that I want to bring up again because it's really important. You can't influence God's love for you. You can't do anything to make him love you less, and you can't do anything to make him love you more than he already does. Now, when Pastor Harold said that, he didn't know it fit right in with my sermon today. And you're going to see how in just a minute. But Pastor Harold is also done with that sermon series. So when four, five, six weeks ago, he asked me if I'd preach today, I said, okay, what are you preaching on? He said, well, it'll be in between. So you get to preach on whatever you want to preach on. He's letting the big dog run today. (laughs) I think it's a good thing for me to get to choose what to preach on. Hopefully, in about 25 minutes, you'll say the same thing. But you might be thinking, okay, so Pastor Harold said you could preach on whatever you want to preach on. So what he did was, was he probably went to his files and got a sermon that he really liked and pulled it out and brushed it up a little bit and that's what he'll do. That's what most normal pastors would do. One of my qualities is I'm not a normal pastor and I'm okay with that. I did not do that. I had an opportunity to reach into the files and grab a sermon that I really liked, but I didn't and, and here's why. This is a story of how I chose what I was going to preach on today. And it starts Easter Sunday morning this year in this room. Right over there where Jan and I normally sit. Now, I don't have our name on that pew yet, but I'm working on it. We were here for Easter Sunday morning. Pastor Harold is preach, getting ready to preach a sermon. He's reading the scripture. Typical Mark 16, 1 to 8 typical sermon or scripture for Easter Sunday morning. It's about how the women went to the tomb. They were going to anoint Jesus' body. They were wondering how they could roll the stone away. They get to the tomb and the stone has already been rolled away and they somehow gather up enough courage to look into the tomb and they see an angel. And the angel says to them, you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He's risen like he said he was going to rise. Now, Mark 16, 7 says this. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter. And then it goes on, but I got to be honest with you, Pastor Harold lost me right there. Don't tell him I said that. But I got lost in thought, including Peter. Of course the angel would say that. It makes sense. I want to preach on that someday. And now, someday is today. I get to preach on two words, including Peter. So being the nerd I am, I went back and looked at my files. And I've preached on this passage, Mark 16, one day, six times. Never once did I emphasize including Peter. I had 21 Easter's while I was a minister. I preached 21 Easter sermons. Never once did I emphasize including Peter. Today I get to include Peter and to tell you why it's so important. So let's talk about Peter for just a minute. Peter was a fisherman. He and his brother, Andrew. They became two of Jesus' first apostles. In fact, Peter kind of worked into the inner circle of what would become the inner circle of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. And and Peter's name is mentioned, and he's in, in more stories in the Gospels than all of the other apostles combined. And some of those stories shed a very, very good light on Peter. For instance, in Matthew 16, Peter does a really good thing. 
Jesus has just told the apostles that they've, he's asking, who am I? And they said, Peter answers correctly, you're, you're the Messiah. And it's then that Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter. And if you back up just a couple of chapters in Matthew 14, Peter has his wow story. And by wow, I mean walk on water. Jesus is coming to the disciples at night. They fear it's a ghost. Jesus says, it's me. Peter says, if it's really you, call me to come out there. So Jesus says, come on out, Peter. Peter has the faith and the guts to fling that leg over the boat and step on the water. Not in it. On it. Now, this is not some farm pond. This is the Sea of Galilee they're on. I got a picture that I took of the Sea of Galilee. It's not just something you, you find the rocks to walk across like the old joke. This is real. This took chutzpah to get out of the boat. Now, I know Peter, Peter failed a little bit and Jesus had to help him, but how many of you would have gotten out of the boat to walk on the water? I've studied Peter and I've come to the conclusion that Peter has a disease. And I come to that conclusion because I have the same disease. It's the disease that allows my mouth to speak before my brain engages. You're laughing like you know that about me. Maybe you're laughing because you know that about you. So I'm going to ask, any of you have that same disease where you can engage your mouth before you engage your brain? Oh yeah, I got hands in the air, I got people nodding, although the people who are nodding may just be nodding off. I'm not quite sure about that. So Peter has the disease and I have it too. And you have it too. You've just admitted that. So let me give you a couple of times in scripture where Peter exhibited this disease. And the first one was Mark 8. In Mark 8, Jesus tells the apostles that the religious leaders are going to kill him and he's going to rise three days later. And a few moments later, Peter kind of takes Jesus aside and starts chastising Jesus for saying such silly things. Do you remember what Jesus told Peter then? Yeah. Get behind me, Satan. And we know that Jesus was right and Peter was out of line. The last one I want to bring up is at the Lord's Supper, the Passover Seder, where Holy Communion was initiated. At the Passover Supper, Jesus is talking to his disciples and says, every one of you will desert me. And Peter, full of bravado, says this, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Do you remember what Jesus told Peter this time? Yeah. Peter, by the time the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Peter goes, nah. You know the rest of the story, right? The Seder dinner is over. The apostles and Jesus head back up over to Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives, and they cross by the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus wants to stop and pray. So they go in, he kind of drops off the disciples at one of the trees there, and this is a picture of the tree, one of the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane that we took while we were there. Jesus goes off to a little rock outcropping and prays, and the disciples promptly what? Fall asleep three times. Judas arrives, kisses Jesus, betraying him. The soldiers grab Jesus and escort him, which is a really polite way of saying half-dragged him. They escorted him to the high priest's house and all of the apostles leave aside from two. 
the beloved disciple John, and our friend, the plucky Peter. And they follow Jesus being half dragged down to the high priest's house. And John, in his gospel, <clears throat> writes that he was able to get to the inner courtyard where Jesus was because he knew somebody at the house. Peter's left in the outer courtyard. Now, <clears throat> before we go on, I, I want to emphasize something. Don't doubt Peter's devotion to Jesus. How many of you would followed the soldiers and an angry mob to the high priest's house after your best friend was just arrested? And you might be too. Don't doubt Peter's devotion. But let's read about what happened in the outer courtyard to Peter. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over to him and said, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore, a curse on me if I am lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. And if that's not enough, Luke adds something even more terrible for Peter. Luke 22, he says, when the rooster crowed, according to Luke, at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. There's a statue at the high priest's house depicting this moment, the denial of Peter, denying knowing Jesus. I wish there would have been one depicting the moment when Jesus looked at him. I want you to put yourself in Peter's place. You, Peter, were at the Last Supper, didn't know it was the Last Supper. Jesus has said, all of you will deny me, all of you will leave me. And G Peter, you say no. Jesus looks at you, Peter, and says, well, you're going to deny knowing me three times by the time the rooster grows. You, Peter, no, never going to happen. Later that night, Jesus is arrested. And you, Peter, follow. And in the courtyard, you, Peter, are asked by three different people, three different times, if you're one of them. And you, Peter, say, no, I don't know him. And then you, Peter, hear the rooster crow. And then you, Peter, see Jesus look right at you. Have you ever let someone down and then seen their face? Maybe it was a child. You made a promise to a child and then you failed to deliver. Too tired, too busy, not interested, some other excuse. Maybe it was to a, a spouse or a significant other. You made a promise to and you failed to deliver. Too tired, too busy. Not interested. Some other excuse. Maybe it was a friend or a coworker or another family member. You made a promise and failed to deliver. Too tired. Too busy. Not interested. Some other excuse. If the offense is deemed large enough, or happens often enough, 
It can lead to irrevocable harm to a relationship. Friendships have ended. Marriages have ended because someone didn't follow through on a promise. Too tired. Too busy. Not interested. Some other excuse. My middle name is Dean, D-E-A-N. I was named after my father's best friend while he was in the Navy. They served in the Navy during their Korean conflict. They were fortunate enough to serve in the Mediterranean Sea and then Cuba. Not very many bullets flying in either of those places during the Korean conflict. Maybe that's why I'm here. But I am named after a man named Dean that was my father's best friend. Now, do I act like Dean? I don't have a clue. I never met Dean. For all I know, my mom never met Dean. I don't know if I act like him. But if they had named me Peter, I could say I acted like my namesake. We've already said that Peter might put his foot in his mouth. I have tasted more shoe leather than I care to admit. We have already said Peter did some things that were good. I, yeah, me too. And Peter did some things that, well, it just made Jesus go, have you ever made Jesus do this? So I could have been named after Peter, and my guess is you too, because all of you have made Jesus go at one time or another. But here's the big one. The big way we're like Peter. Sometimes, like Peter, you and I deny knowing Jesus. Now, do not get your tomatoes out just yet. Let me finish. We may not verbally deny knowing, knowing Jesus three times like Peter did. We might not even verbally say, I deny knowing Jesus. But we certainly go through times when we deny knowing him by not acknowledging that we know him. By staying silent when we should have spoken. Or we deny knowing Jesus by doing something that Jesus, we know. We know in our heart Jesus wouldn't want us to do. Or we say something that we know Jesus would not want us to say. And it's so easy to fall into that trap. It's so easy when someone is gossiping about somebody else or trash talking about somebody else. It's so easy to fall in the trap and go right along with them. When the Democrats are dissing the Republicans or the Republicans are dissing the Democrats, it's so easy to join in. Not like that ever happens, right? When the ins are talking about the outs or the outs talking about the ins or the haves talking about the have-nots and the have-nots talking about the haves or the Badger fans talking about the Gopher fans or the Gopher fans talking about the Badger fans talking bad about them. We shouldn't be doing it. Jesus wouldn't want us to do that, I don't think. but we fall. I want you to remember something. To say or do something that we know Jesus would not want us to say or do is to deny that we know Jesus. We don't have to say the words, I deny knowing Jesus. Other words are silence our actions or our inactions are just as effective. We can deny knowing Jesus just like Peter did. So let's get back to Peter. When we left Peter, he was in the garden or running away from the garden after hearing the rooster crow and after seeing Jesus look right at him. Put yourself in Peter's place. How would you feel? Crushed? Devastated? Distraught? Shattered? Those are four adjectives that would fit, and those are not fleeting feelings. 
Those are feelings that may last quite a while. I'm sure Peter felt that way on Friday. During the trial, during the walk to Golgotha, the Via Dolorosa, during the crucifixion, during the aftermath that night. I'm sure Peter felt that way on Saturday. We don't know what the apostles did, but I can guarantee you Peter wasn't feeling very good. If there was a mirror where they were staying, and mirrors have been around about 6,000 years, so there could have been, he probably couldn't have looked at a mirror that day. He had terrible thoughts going through his head. Am I worthy to be here with the rest of the apostles? Judas betrayed Jesus. We don't want him here. The apostles want me here. Now, in truth, we don't know how many of them knew. John was the only one that followed with Peter. John went to the inner courtyard, according to John, so maybe nobody knew that Peter denied Jesus. Or maybe Peter liked him out. He might have told everybody when they got back together. We don't know. But I'm sure Peter was thinking, am I worthy to be here? I'm sure Peter was also thinking, Jesus is dead. There was no way I can make this up to him. There's no way I can say to him, I'm sorry. I love you. There's no way to atone for my sin. Those thoughts followed Peter all day Friday all day Saturday, and Sunday didn't start out looking too great either. I was born in central Indiana. I lived in central Indiana, a town in in and around the town of Anderson, for 58 of my 60 plus years, 66 plus years. And just just a little north of us, about 10 miles north of us, is a little town named Alexandria. Alexandria, Indiana. Have any of you ever heard of it? I, there's one. Yay! Go Alec, the Alec Tigers. Some of you may know someone from Alexandria or have heard of them. There was a group from Alexandria called the Gaithers, big-time gospel artists. They were really big, nationally, internationally, and that made them really big in our area. My, my mom and dad were fans. My dad was a big fan. He, that's all we heard at home in music was dad playing the Gaither records. And I mean records, the vinyls, the LPs. But they wrote a song, performed a song, and it was called, Then Came the Morning. It's the song that Pastor Paul sang for us today. The morning was that first Easter morning. That first Easter morning, when the women were going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, wondering how they were going to get the stone rolled away, seeing the stone rolled away, having the courage to look inside, seeing the angel, hearing the angel say, you're looking for Jesus, he's not here, he's risen as he said he would. Now, Go and tell the disciples, including Peter. Remember that verse? Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter. That's where this sermon started. Go and tell his disciples, including Peter. Can you feel the excitement, consternation, confusion of the women? They run back to where the apostles are at. And and none of the four gospel writers tell us exactly how it went down that the women told the apostles. But it's got to have gone something like this. I see the women getting back there and busting the door open, and and Mary speaks. She takes the lead and says, we were going to the tomb, we were going to anoint the body, we were wondering how we are going to get the stone rolled away, and she's out of breath, she's going, (gasps) and then she finally goes, and and the stone was rolled away, and we got the courage to look in, and we looked inside, and there was this angel, and he's talking so fast they can hardly understand her. There was this angel, and the angel said, you're looking for Jesus, he's not here, he's risen from the dead, he's going on to Galilee like he told you he would, and then she slows down and stops and looks right at Peter and says, 
and he included you by name. Now put yourself in Peter's place. All that time, for two days, you have felt like whale poo on the bottom of the ocean. You have wondered how you could ever let your best friend down. You have wondered how you could have lied to those people. You've wondered if the apostles still want you. You've wondered if Jesus would even want you if he was here. He's dead, it didn't run. Now you hear Jesus is alive and wants you by name. How do you feel? Oh, the clouds have lifted. The storm is gone. There's a marching band in the back going, da, 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 da. Maybe not the marching band, but you know what I mean. Peter is excited. And now I get to be that Billy Mays. Any of you know who Billy Mays is? He's that late night infomercial guy who always hawks whatever he's hawking. He goes, all the good things about it. And then he goes, but wait, there's more. (laughs) Pastor Gary says, but wait, there's more. The story isn't over. Neither is the sermon. There's more for Peter. Easter evening, Jesus appears to the apostles. Aside from Thomas, he's not there. And a week later, Jesus appears again to the apostles. This time, Thomas is there. Remember the touch me in the side where I'm sore? And then sometime later, within the next month or so, Jesus again appears to the apostles. It's in John 21. And I'll tell you the story. The apostles have been waiting around for Jesus in Galilee because that's where he said to go. And nothing. So they decide to go fishing to pass the time away. They're fishermen, most of them. So they go fishing. Now they fish at night. I never understood that, but evidently fish bite better at night. I don't know. Not a fisherman. They fish all night. They fish all night. And they caught Zippo. They got skunked. The fish were smarter than them that night. And then about daybreak, there's a guy on land, 100 yards away, and says, hey, have you caught anything? My guess is at this point, the boat's got really quiet because there's not a fisherman alive who wants to admit they got skunked. Somebody finally musters up enough courage. No, we haven't caught anything. Probably in that tone. And the guy on shore says, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And they do. Why? Maybe to show the guy there weren't any fish there. Maybe because I had nothing to lose. They throw the nets on the other side of the boat and the nets are immediately full. John looks at Peter and says, it's Jesus. Peter, our friend the plucky Peter, jumps in and swims to shore, about 100 yards. Now I got a granddaughter who's on the swim team. She could do that Grandpa, maybe not. Maybe if I knew Jesus was on shore, maybe I'd make it, but I don't know. But Peter gets there, and then finally the other boat gets there and brings the fish, and they have what scholars call the breakfast on the beach. Now, that's not the most reverent title that you could have, but it's accurate. They had a breakfast on the beach. It's after the breakfast what happens. It's important, so let's read it. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked a question the third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Here's a picture of the chapel that commemorates what's called Peter's primacy. And and you can see that rocky beach there. I'm at the edge of the Sea of Galilee behind me and looking at that chapel. 
So Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. Jesus gives him the opportunity to atone for that. Do you love me? Yes, three times. Peter was given a chance to make amends, to atone for what he'd done. We are too. Jesus is probably not going to come back, cook you breakfast on the beach, and ask you in person. Maybe. Probably not. But through prayer, you get your opportunity to say, I'm sorry I denied you. You know I love you. Now, I want to ask a very important question. During all of this, at the exact moment when Peter first denied Jesus, second denied Jesus, third denied Jesus, and the rooster crowed, do you think Jesus stopped loving Peter? No. Jesus never stopped loving Peter. When you deny knowing Jesus, whether you say outright, I deny knowing him, or like most of us, you're silent or do something you shouldn't, do you think Jesus stops loving you? No. 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 Jesus always loves you. And every day in prayer, you have an opportunity to make amends, to atone, to say, I'm sorry. I do love you. Paul sang the song this morning, then came the morning, so we're going to put up a few words from the chorus. Then came the morning, night turned into day. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. That song was written about Easter Sunday morning when hope literally rose, when Jesus rose. But hope also rose that dawn for Peter after the breakfast on the beach when he was given a chance to amend. Just like we are given the chance to amend, to atone. Know that Jesus loves you. Even though we've denied knowing Jesus, Maybe not as vocally as Peter, but just as effectively with our actions and inactions. We know Jesus still loves us and listens when we say we're sorry and we still love him. Peter found that out. He knows. And now you do too. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for those two very, very important words, including Peter. because it could have been written about each one of us, including us. We thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to say we're sorry. We thank you for the opportunity to say that we love you. And we are just immensely thankful that you never stop loving us, even when we're trying to prove we're unlovable. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.